Hello, I'm Chef Paul McCormick from the Culinary Arts and Hospitality Program here at Community College of Philadelphia. Today, I'm going to do something that very few people will attempt. I'm going to do Thanksgiving dinner in one hour. It sounds crazy, but I can actually take a 18 pound turkey and get it all ready and on the table in an hour with very little prep time ahead of time. One of the things that, as a chef, that we always do is our mise en place. Uh, growing up, I remember my mother would set the table on Monday for dinner on Thursday. The more things you can do ahead of time, the better. Um, and in most home kitchens, you have four burners in one oven. So I'm going to accomplish the task today of cooking an entire Thanksgiving dinner with a, a total starch fest with sweet potatoes, mashed potatoes, and stuffing, asparagus. I'll make a fresh cranberry sauce and a giblet gravy and roast turkey. And I'll have it all done from raw to the table in an hour. Get ready, here we go. First I'm gonna start with the bird. This is an 18 pound frozen turkey right out of the supermarket. To get the job done, as I do this, I'm, I'm, the trick is I'm not gonna roast the whole bird. I'm gonna take it apart the same way you would buy um, a chicken apart. You'll buy the breast separately, the legs separately. I'm gonna do the exact same thing with this bird and I'm going to take the breasts off, I'm gonna take the thighs off, I'm gonna cut it apart, and I'm gonna put it into the oven with, I'm going to season it, but I'm gonna put cook it on a rack above the pan, so it's not actually gonna to touch the pan. I'm gonna have it thin, I'm gonna take the tender off the back, I'll show you that in a second. After I take the, take the flesh off the carcass, and I'm going to cook it separately. So I'm actually gonna cook a, a, basically a roast turkey breast that is going to come out absolutely beautiful, but it's going to be relatively thin in comparison with the rest of the bird. That's one breast, I'll take the other one off. And I'm also going to do the thighs, so I'll have light meat and dark meat roasted and ready to go inside my time frame of one hour. Now, in order to cook this to uh, temperature, to get right, I'm gonna start it out at a 450 degree oven, which I have preheated, so I can start right away with the cooking process. Part of that, um, process is making sure that I have enough skin to cover the flesh and after I have the skin covering the flesh that'll keep it from direct heat reduction because just like if you take boiling water and you drop chicken or any protein product or an egg into boiling water 212 um, the flesh tightens up it turns right away and starts to change its texture and tightens up. I don't want the muscle to tighten up too much. It's going to, sh you know, reduce in size, but I don't want it to stiffen up and get really hard and, and have it make it uh, relatively tough. Um, it doesn't take that much to cook this type of protein in that amount of time. I'm rushing through the butchering process for this part because I definitely, to get inside my time frame, I want to get this done as quickly and in the oven as quickly as I can. So one of the things that I want to do is I want to remove the thigh from the drumstick. When this is apart, I get to use just the thigh meat, which is, cl which is classically the dark meat. Slow moving muscle tissue has more myoglobin in it. I'll use the drumsticks, except I'll cook them in stock so that I'm still going to have dark meat to serve but it's not going to be from the whole drumstick. So in order to get this in the oven as quickly as I can, I'm going to debone the thigh and the quicker I get this in the oven the more time it's going to have to set up and cook very very well. I did a test on this, I just don't turn around and make a statement like I could cook Thanksgiving dinner in an hour and actually try it. I already did this, so I already know it's going to work. But one of the things that happens is you can have your turkey in real terms. If I'm going to do this and I'm not doing it for an episode of uh, The Chef's Cook, I'm going to have this lined up so that I'll do all this work ahead of time and I'll have it prepped or my mise en place together so that when I do go to actually produce this meal in an hour, say if I'm going somewhere else and cooking with someone else's stove and I don't have the luxury of 
transporting a whole roast turkey, but I still want to get everything else done on one stove, that makes it a little bit more difficult. So what I do is I use my mise en place and get as much prep work done ahead, as, uh, ahead of time as possible. For today's episode, I did very little of that because I wanted to show how this can be done in an hour without a lot of prep time and actually get the product to come out absolutely beautiful. Now, one of the things that I'm doing is I'm gonna butterfly this out, which is actually taking and slicing the meat away so it lays flat like this. Because what I'm going to do, once I get this in the oven and I have this flat, I can almost predict how long it'll take to cook and get all the way to a beautifully roasted turkey that no one outside of the kitchen and the people watching this show would know the difference. Okay, on the back, this is typically what, they, what is referred to as the tender, the, the turkey tender or the chicken tender. I'm gonna reduce that. I'm also gonna butterfly this part of the breast away so that it all lays one layer and relatively flat because I wanna cover as much of the flesh as I can with skin because that's gonna help keep all the meat from getting too dry and uh, away from direct heat in the oven. Okay, so if I take, this is the neck, and I take the neck flesh and I cover this. This is what I wanna have end up covering with my turkey. So what would have been a large roast that was large and round, now it's all flat and even. I'm gonna roast this on a, a flat pan like this, but before I do it, I wanna season it. And for seasoning today, I'm gonna to use tarragon, which is one of my favorite herbs for poultry. I'm just gonna spread lots of tarragon over and under. I'm gonna use Dijon mustard, okay? So this is somewhat French. I'm gonna use my hands. I'm gonna to do top and bottom. So I arranged it on the cutting board and on the, and on the uh, roasting pan so that I get um, the even. So I basically set it up so I know what it'll look like. I'll rearrange it once I get it on the pan and I'm done marinating this and seasoning this so that it comes out just right. I'm gonna use seasoning salt and pepper. Again, when we go to season, us chefs, some go heavy, but I always like to be 18 inches above and spread it so that when it falls out all over the place, I'm getting an even distribution of my seasonings without having it have big, big lumps of certain things where all you taste is, is the spice. This is my pepper. Okay, now I'm going to do the same thing. I'm gonna manipulate this, season it. In barbecue language, this would be, I'd be rubbing it. So now I wanna arrange this on my pan so that everything is going to lay as flat as I can. My dark meat, okay. I'm gonna arrange breast number one. I didn't number them, it's just the way they come out. All right, my second breast. I want these to be even, flat. Flat is probably the most important part to get this in and in time so that I have it all covered with skin to protect it from the excessive heat starting at 450 degrees. I'm gonna keep it at 450 degrees for 20 minutes. Then I'm gonna turn it down to 350. Okay, this goes in the oven now. I don't think that took more than five or six minutes. That's, the, that's one of the secrets to make it work. The next thing I wanna do is get my potatoes on, okay? Smash potatoes first. Rest the potatoes, I've already washed them. I'm gonna peel them, dice them, and put them in some water and get them boiling. All right, as quickly as I can, peel. Uh, there's a little thing that I saw online the other day of a, of a chef peeling apples with a drill. Awesome. Okay, well I need to get a food service level um, drill with a wood bit and just start spinning these things right off. But I can do it by the time I figure that out, get that all set up and cleaned up after the peels fly all over the place, I'll be done. Okay, when you go, I have four different peelers here. All right, there's some peelers that are serrated that are great for doing sweet potatoes, but not that great for doing regular potatoes or peeling asparagus. So it's something as simple as 
you know, my mother's good old fashioned echo peeler, which is what I grew up on. I still have one of them that has the other end where you can julienne string beans. They're wonderful. But for my case, if I was going to do this on one of my mise en place done, I would have my potatoes peeled already, diced, and in cold water in the, in the refrigerator, and I'd just take them out and put them on the stove. But just for the, for the sake of this exercise of doing Thanksgiving dinner in an hour from just everything I have sitting around, it's a little bit easier if I just do it like this. Plus, it's a little bit more of a challenge, a little bit more exciting. Because I have a couple of bets going on it, whether I can do this or not. And of course, I don't like to bet unless I'm going to win. So I practiced and made sure that I could get this done. Okay, mashed potatoes. This is a starch fest. For flavor, when I go to finish this up, I'm going to add Parmesan cheese. I'll have Parmesan mashed potatoes. Okay, I can't not, it's just like adding the tarragon and the mustard to the turkey. It's not going to be your standard turkey because I am cooking it fast. And I want to be able to say, wow, that tastes really, really good. What did you do differently? Well, I cooked it in an hour. Are you kidding me? Did you really? So, but the idea here being is this is just about as quick as it gets. Okay, we can do it fast. You know, watch the fingers don't, don't leave the, uh, the end of the hands. As quickly as I can get this peeled and diced and in water, that's my next step in the process. Now, I will do the same with my sweet potatoes. I'm going to boil them and then I'll glaze them in the oven in the end because right now I still have space in the oven. I have one other shelf that I'm going to be putting both my candied yams or candied sweet potatoes. They're yams actually, candied yams. And I'll be putting this stuffing in because stuffing, you figure it's going to be a stuffing. I'll make the stuffing and I'll show you the secret to make it nice and moist without putting it in the bird because typically if you're going to roast it in the bird it actually acts as a sponge and draws a lot of moisture from the actual flesh with the protein being a lot of water and before I have it in the bird that helps me take away moisture I'm going to have it in the oven and I'm going to add moisture. I'm making a stock from the, the drumsticks that I already put in there and the rest of the carcass when I have that ready, I'll add that stock directly into the stuffing. So I'm actually going to have turkey stock in the stuffing that's going to make it taste just like it came out of the bird. Now, sweet potatoes. All right, different potato, different peeler. Okay, I'm using a longer peel. Now, somebody asked me once, you know, you know when you go to peel vegetables, What's, is there a secret to doing it? There is kind of a secret. If you notice, I real, I'm resting the, the, the um, in this case, the sweet potato or the yam right on the cutting board. I'm actually pressing it down like this. So that's actually putting pressure on the vegetable and holding it still so I can press harder than if I'm holding it up in my hand. Okay, because I want this, I want all the peel off, obviously. But if I'm pressing down, I get to remove as much of the peel as I can without holding it in my hand and trying to manipulate it like that. So as I press down, I can take longer strokes, almost the entire length of the tuber, or the, uh, the potato, or the yam in this case, and then get as much of the peel off as I can quickly. This, the drill thing, I don't think would work with this. Okay, different peelers, different reasons. They actually make asparagus peelers for peeling asparagus. For the very, very large, we're going to have asparagus today, but I'm not even going to peel it because it's nice and thin. Okay, nice and thin and tender. Okay, same thing. Now, for the candy part, I'm going to do this. I'll boil these first, and I'll put them in the oven just to finish the candying process or the glazing process, which is all the bad stuff you're not supposed to have. You know, butter, sugar, all the things that I get yelled at for eating at this point because, you know, it's not healthy, but Thanksgiving comes but once a year. And if you're going to do it, go big. Go big or go home. Well, everybody goes home for Thanksgiving. That's a good part. But if you're going, you want butter. All right, chefs, the French, butter. It's a chef's best friend. All right, getting there. When I was training with the chef who trained me, he says, move with a sense of purpose or in place, do it faster. 
do it faster. So I ended up getting as much speed as I could handle and still getting accurate product because if I made mistakes, I always had to go back and do it. So if he says, do it faster, but do it right. Well, what do you want, faster or right? I always went faster. Because if I did it fast and it came out right, I was good. But if I did it fast and I had to redo it, I still had time to do it. And since time is of the essence today, okay, three, four, there we go, got my count. Again, what I teach students here at college, clean as you go, work clean, work neat. It's a big challenge for some of them, but the ones who do it understand the beauty of how working fast and clean are two things that can go hand in hand and make your product that much better. All right, a few other pieces, I'll take those off with the knife. Take the ends. It's always easier when you're cutting something round like this that's very fibrous like this or a carrot. If you first cut it in half, okay, and lay it flat. I'm very careful not to get my fingers down underneath this because these are hard to get through, butternut squash and things of that nature, where the skin or the outside is hard but you still have to cut it up. It's always easier to cut it now if it's laying flat like it is on the deck right now. Okay, still about bite size, a little bit more than a fork. Okay, so one goes, one goes on a utensil. My finished cut, so I want them all about even. This is one of the skills proficiency in class that students are required to do. Make sure they all look, you know, they'd probably give me a solid B for this. But they can't do it as fast as I can, so I'm in for speed. And when you're sitting at the table, you're not really going to be wondering as you're eating this, did the chef do it fast? The chef only worries about if it's fast. Now, when we go to a big dinner like this, we're always trying to figure out how much do I make? And how does that happen where you have four burners, four burners and one oven, how do you get it all done in time for dinner? That's what we're gonna be working on. So. Water, potatoes. To get it all hot and on the table, when you do large parties or large events where a lot of people are coming and their family or friends, it's always easier if someone is bringing part of the dinner and you're responsible for making pieces of it. I have my list. I did this so that I know what my timing is. Turkey, stock, potatoes, sweet potatoes. Now I'm gonna do the stuffing. Part of the stuffing is the stock that I have to make. So before I go to make my stuffing, I'm gonna bolster my stock. Uh, I'm gonna take regular vegetables, my carrots. Now normally I take the tops and the bottoms. Okay, tops and bottoms. This, I already have the drumsticks in there, so I'm just adding everything I need to it. I need the tops of the celery and the bottoms. I'm gonna use the ribs inside the stuffing. So all this other stuff that I don't need, I'm gonna take, I'm gonna use it, and I'm gonna put this into the stock. Okay, my stems from the herbs I'm gonna use. So I'm gonna use some rosemary. You know that song, Parsley Bay, Rosemary and Thyme is what we say. I'm gonna use some sage. I'm gonna add my, my herbs. I'm gonna add some shallots, little onions. I'm gonna add some garlic. Okay, real simple. Simple chop right through. Not gonna to get too crazy. I'm gonna add some leek, both top and bottom. Okay, it makes a beautiful stock. Okay, I'm gonna add to my stock, I'm gonna add some bay leaf and some peppercorn. One bay leaf per gallon of liquid, okay? I also already have put away some stock. I'm cheating. Yes, I'm cheating. I did some mise en place. So I'm gonna add my stock. And I had it in the freezer, so now I have a big lump of ice in there, which is just fine. I'm gonna take some veal stock, which is a darker stock. This will make it a more rich for both the stuffing and for the giblet gravy. I'm gonna cheat on the giblet gravy too. Okay, so now I have a little brown stock and a little 
plain chicken stock. Now, I'm going to show you the, the trick with the giblets. Look, the giblets are everything you get in that bag, which would be the neck, okay, the liver, the heart, okay. This is what they give me in that little bag, okay. The giblets, the heart, and the liver. I'm going to take all of this, this part, and put this, the neck, and put this into my stock. That's going to be simmering, okay. But in order to get the giblets out of my stock, I'm going to wrap them up in some cheesecloth, all right? This allows them to steep, kind of like, this is kind of like a tea bag. So I'm going to get the flavor from the, from the stock into the giblets without having to fish through the stock to get the giblets out. So, a little bit of cheesecloth, a little string, I'm going to tie it up. Now, generally, to get it out, you can tie this, if you have a big stock pot, you're going to tie this with a larger piece of string to the handle so you can easily pull it out. This is a small pot. It really doesn't make that big of a difference. So I'm just going to take this. I'm going to cut this off. So basically, I have a tea bag filled with all of my giblets. I'm going to put that right in the stock. Now, the stock is also coming up lovely. I can turn the potatoes down a little bit, and I'm going to start my stuffing. Now, start my stuffing. I have hot Italian sausage and sweet Italian sausage chopped up. So I have, I'm going to get the flavor from the fat and from the meat, and I'm also going to add bacon, okay? This is going to give me a little bit of fat and a lot of flavor. The stock is going to help, the herbs are going to help, the vegetables are going to help, but this is going to give me a really unique flavor and it's going to add moisture for me for when I do the stuffing. Now, you're going to adjust the moisture to the, the stuffing the way you would adjust the moisture when you're adding a sauce or slicing the meat and making sure that it comes out just right. In this case, as this cooks down, I'm going to add my vegetables. What I'm basically doing is making a suit, and this suit is something that will carry. The vegetables are going to carry moisture and flavor throughout the stuffing. It gives it body and flavor other than bread. These are flavors that by themselves I really wouldn't have in my stuffing or, or in, you know, just sitting with bread. But bread is the sponge that's going to hold up the liquid that I'm going to make between everything I put in this, in this stuffing to hold the moisture of against as a starch to hold it against the protein. Again, cut it faster. Right, I'm going to use rub sage or sage, fresh sage, and we're going to add some fresh tarragon to the inside of the stock. I don't want the stems, I just want the leaves. Pull them off. It, again, I could have done this the day before, but you don't get the rush factor of trying to get it done under the time, like, like um, you know, uh, Iron Chef and all, that, all those competition shows where they want to see you do it all fast. Fast is what we can do. It's not what we really want to do, but it's just how we do it. Some fresh chives. I'm going to use some basil in here too. It's going to give it a nicer, more I have thyme. I'm going to take thyme. I'm going to add a little bit of basil. I'm just going to do this caveman style. Just rip it off. Run through it quickly. The smell is fantastic. This looks good, smells delicious. Again, sense of urgency. I have things going. Right about the time I have the dressing ready for the stuffing, and this is just like making a, a dressing, I'm going to be ready to check my turkey and adjust the temperature down. Okay, turn that down just a bit, all right, because I don't want it to burn, but I definitely want it to reduce a little bit. One of the seasonings I'm going to add is Bell's seasoning. This is the flavor that I grew up with because it's the poultry seasoning that goes with most stuffings. It's finely ground rub, sage, marjoram, thyme, Yay. parsley, there's a bunch of things in it, but it has a really unique flavor. I still haven't adjusted. Yeah, 
Ooh, that smells. I wish that I wish you'd be able to smell this because it smells phenomenal. This is the smell you get when you come into the house when the turkey's turkey's been roasting all day. You're getting that smell. I already have it. It's shorter than the time we're going to serve really quickly, but I already have the smell in the house, so I already won twice. All right? This is going. Remember, I still have only four burners. Okay, I have the stock on one. I have potatoes on two and the start of the stuffing on three. So I'm going to turn the stuffing down. I'm going to watch the stuff. The stock is starting to boil. I don't really want it to boil. But the one big thing that I'm missing right now is cutting up the bread. I can cut up the bread really fast. But it's time to check the turkey. I've had it in now for probably, I'm not even watching the time. I'm just getting it done. So in order to get this to where I need to be, now i got to check the turkey to make sure it's on target. Oh my, this is, ugh, this is beautiful. Everything that I said needed to have happened, happened. The skin protected the flesh. It's at, the, it's at that right temperature. I have the flesh right where I need to be. You see how reduced in size, but it's still fully, just about fully cooked. But I still want to slow it down now and keep it tender. So I'm going to turn the temperature down, in this case, probably to 300. I'm playing it by ear. I could stick it with a thermometer, but I, you know, I don't want to get it messed up. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stick this right back in and cut it down to 300. Okay. That's going fine. I'm going to check my potatoes, but before I do that, I've got to cut the bread. Just like I said earlier, my mother would have the bread cut two days in advance. Okay, I'm using a combination of French bread, Texas toast, and some sandwich rolls. Uh, I usually don't like to use any um, dark bread or sourdough bread. It, it, it makes a, a funky flavor that doesn't complement everything else that I'm using. It's actually a stronger flavor, and for this, I want a lighter flavor that kind of covers up so that I can get all the flavors that I have in my suit out just for the bread. All right? I'm going to use a big bowl when I go to mix this up. As quickly as I can get this cut is better for me, okay? Because right after this, my oven space now, I have one pan in there and just enough space to put the baked sweet potatoes in with the candied yams and a, a pan of the stuffing, all right? And I'm going to use glass, um, glass casserole dishes because the glass will transfer a little bit better and it's the size where I can take them right from the oven to the table. Because here again, I'm still playing that, that time is of the essence um, plan of getting it done in an hour. Okay. I just turn this, I can hear it crackling. I don't want to lose too much more moisture in the dressing or the, the, uh, the dressing for the stuffing. It's easy to cut when the roll's already cut. One cut and I'm already through everything I need. Now when I go to mix this, I'm gonna add my stock. And there's a, I have a trick to get the stock out of there without actually straining the entire pot. So I'm gonna end up with my flavor just right and still have everything I need to season the stuffing and put this in my pans. Okay, just about done. See, I can always, cut very fast, so I wasn't worried about getting too much of this stuff done ahead of time. This will be enough stuffing. This would be the equivalent of stuffing um, the 18 pound bird, but for right now, this is just enough to make the stuffing to put it in the oven. Now I gotta get my mixing bowl. I'm gonna toss all the bread in. Now, part of what I have to do is add my flavoring, add my moisture, Adjust the seasoning. Whatever the stock is going to taste like is exactly what the, the bread, the stuffing is going to taste like. Because the stuffing is nothing, a bread, it looks like a sponge. It's going to absorb whatever flavors I have in the big saute pan with the sausage, the bacon, the fresh herbs, and all my seasoning that I put in there. So whatever I put in that is going to make the flavor for this. So right now I have sausage my bacon, my onions, my celery. I have to break this up a little bit. Okay, it smells delicious. Oh my, I, I, you know, I wish it would be easy to send smell. It's fogging up my glasses. Okay, spraying out liberally over the top. Now here's the trick. Okay, I wanna deglaze this, so I'm actually gonna take some stock. 
with the ladle and deglaze. I'm going to take this in the pan. Pan's already hot. I'm going to, you'll see the color change because all my, everything that was caramelized on the bottom of that pan is now going into the stock that I'm putting in there and it's going to flavor, help flavor my, flavor my dressing or my stuffing, I'm sorry. Stuffing or dressing, that's always a question, that's tomato, tomato. The difference between dressing and stuffing and stuffing is stuffed. Dressing, which is really what this is, is going to be outside the bird, it's not going to be stuffed. So it's dressing. It's like that, Angel, what's the difference between sauce and gravy? Gravy always had the drippings from roasted or sauteed meats. So in that same realm, how you use it is the big trick. Okay, now here's the trick to take the stock out without straining it all the way off. My stock's boiling. I'm going to put it onto my cutting board. I'm going to add this, this strainer on the inside. I'm going to take my ladle, put it inside the strainer so I, I'm not getting interference or picking up any pieces of my stock so that everything I'm pouring over the, the stuffing is going to be straight stock without having to worry about little bits of leek or little herbs or leaves in there because I just want the liquid. I don't want anything else. This is the liquid that I'm using to moisten the bread. It tastes phenomenal. That's my flavor that I'm gonna end up with when I put the stuffing next to the roast turkey that's going to be on the table that everyone is gonna think I took out of the bird. All right? I can always add more, but I can't take it out. So let me check this. This will reduce in volume as the bread picks up moisture, picks up the stock, and basically turns mushy. This is why if you add some hard crusted breads, or some breads with more earthy outside or crusty bread, the crust won't absorb as much as the fleshy uh, center part of the dried white bread. So I'm gonna end up with, I don't want it terribly mushy, I want some texture, but moisture and all this wonderful, wonderful flavor. You see it's just about half the size. So let me take this, I'm gonna add a little bit more. Uh, this is a four ounce ladle, so the rough measuring wise for the people who have to measure, each time, I, each time I do four ladles, it's back to basically a cup of stock. All right, now I don't need more. I'm gonna put this back on the stove. Okay, that's one simmer. Now I'm gonna finish tossing, stirring, tossing. Now it's reduced by about half, okay? You can see the steam coming off, it's already hot. This is at 212 degrees at least. Okay, all my flavors in there, my color looks good. Now in order to get half a crust on it, I'm gonna take it and put this in my casserole dish, put it in the oven. Okay, now I can take this and I'm just gonna put enough of. I can probably fill this up three quarters of the way, or all the way, but I'll use three quarters of my stuffing. very, very moist. All that bread that filled up this entire bowl ends up with just enough to get into this casserole dish. I'm going to mound it over. It's not going to spill in the oven, but I managed to get basically almost two loaves of bread and a bunch of rolls into this pan. I'm going to have all this crusted over, but the inside of this is going to remain remarkably moist. And the more I press this down, the more it actually turns into one large casserole. And one of the things that I'll do with this is I'm going to put this on a sheet pan. Look at that. Everything that I had in this bowl, I fit into one casserole. This can go right in on top, next to, on the top shelf above the turkey, and this will cook at the same time as the rest of the turkey. Potatoes are done, sweet potatoes. I've been watching them. I'm gonna pour these out through the strainer and then put them in my casserole. Really simply. Beautiful. Okay, 
already done. It smells just like it should. Okay, maple syrup, a little bit. Whoa! All right. This is a little cinnamon, cardamom, allspice, a little bit of butter. I'm gonna fleck in whole butter. Man, butter's good. You only do this once a year. Do it right. Okay. There's enough sugar. I'm gonna use a little bit of brown sugar. Not a lot. I'm slicing it thin and laying it out. Okay. A little bit of dark brown sugar. Some people like marshmallows. I like them. But for this case, I'm just gonna keep it simple. Do it quickly. All right, it's my glazed, ready to go in. Okay. Now, asparagus. Get my water on. Okay, because I'm here again. I'm just down to all, both my burners. I have four burners. What I have running now, I'm gonna get my asparagus ready. I already have it done. It's thin enough where I don't have to peel it. I'm gonna take the bottoms off. Now the bottoms, I actually take these off and I use those for stock as well, okay? But since I already have my stock, I'll use those when I cook the carcass. Because if you remember, I didn't use the wings and I didn't use the carcass. I still want to have the turkey soup three days from now. I'm just going to have to make the stock the way I made it in the previous episode from a raw product. But for right now, as soon as that water boils, I'm going to put my asparagus in and when this comes out, Usually when we did vegetables, we blanch and shock and then reconstitute and reheat it and put it back. In this case, I'm not even gonna do that. I'm gonna take them right from the pot and season them, put them right on a platter ready to serve. So this is one of the last things that we're gonna be doing. Okay, I'll take these, I'm gonna put these in my stock pot and use those for later, right? While I'm waiting, I wanna make a fresh cranberry sauce. My saute pan, get it hot. I have fresh, raw cranberries. I have dried cranberries, which I've soaked and made tender. I have ginger, shallot, and orange. I'm gonna make a quick reduction of ginger, shallot. This, these are sweet little onions, little, little sharp. I'm gonna use these, the shells of these, also in my stock, so I'll put these with the asparagus tops. Okay, a little bit of butter in the pan. And what I'm going to do is saute and heat up ginger. I'm going to dice fine. I want my pan to get nice and hot when I go to start because I'm actually going to caramelize some sugar. This smells phenomenal. Ginger and orange go together so well and the tart of the cranberry. I want to, the ginger is spicy hot, but it's also really fibrous. So one of the things I want to end up doing is getting this as reduced as possible, actually candying my ginger so it takes the, takes the fiber out, makes it more tender, and also takes a little bit of the sharp edge off. Now my cranberries as a whole, okay, just dicing this up loosely. Okay, pan is hot. All right, I'm gonna add butter. It's just enough to make some noise and add my, my onions and my ginger. I just wanna get them tender. Butter burns. If the pan is too hot, I'll burn the butter and it'll change it to a nutty flavor. This is just right because the butter's not burning, but I'm getting the hot butter to tenderize my, my shallots and my, my uh, ginger to make it work with the cranberries, the fresh cranberries, which I'm going to put in. While that's going on, I'm going to use my zester and I'm actually going to zest orange peel into my fresh cranberries. All right, now if you see this, when this happens, I go over this once because the pith, the white part of this orange is bitter. But I want all the oils to come out. 
when I zest it and take orange peel. What I'm going to do is use the, the zest, the peel, and some of the juice in this for the body of my sauce. I'm making sure I'm not getting that too dark. I can put this right in my cranberries, glazing, whoa, glazing my cranberries. Still hot, maybe add a little butter, a little bit, just to keep the moisture up. I want these to actually tenderize, they're hollow. When they, when cranberries are harvested, they actually put, they flood the field and then they agitate the bushes and the berries float to the top. It's actually a pretty interesting thing. All right, I'm gonna finish zesting this. Okay, I'm gonna cut these and wedge them as I'm doing this, because once I get this in, all I have to do is let this cook on the stove, and instead of having a cold cranberry sauce, I'm gonna have a hot cranberry sauce, hot temperature-wise. Okay, now, I'll add a little bit of plain sugar, white sugar, because there is no sugar. Cranberries, when you buy the dried cranberries, which I have, they're already sweetened. There's not a lot of sugar here. There'll be some sweetness from the orange, but not enough to sweeten the whole sauce the way people typically think of cranberry sauce. As soon as that starts to caramelize, I'll add some orange wedges and the finished juice from this orange. Again, I'm moving quickly. Peeling an orange or peeling any veg, or I'm sorry, any fruit that you're going to use requires a little bit sharper of a knife. My knives are pretty sharp, sharp enough to get through that with little problem. They're just starting to break. Once they break, they're actually the cranberry, the outside of the cranberry is caramelizing enough to change the color of the ginger to cranberry. Okay. This is once it's done hot, I'm gonna to add to my dried cranberries now. Okay. I'm gonna take my oranges, oops, I'm gonna dice them. Make sure I de-seed it. There's a couple of seeds in here. Take out as much of the membrane as I can. I'm going to add this right in with the rest of the zest. Okay, now. Now, as this cooks, it will reduce. It's not going to turn into a jelly cranberry sauce. It's going to just reduce itself and be a, like a chunk, almost like a relish. If I had to pick a consistency, it's going to make a, a little bit of, a little bit more sauce as this reduces. The, between the sugar and the heat, I'm going to make a little bit of sauce, actually liquid, but I want it to reduce slowly and turn into what will end up looking like a relish. So I'm going to take this off the high heat, put it on the lower heat. Okay, my water is just about boiling for my asparagus. Okay, so I turn the cranberries in the back on the back burner, turn them down to a low simmer. All right, now it's time to do my potatoes. It's time to drain my mashed potatoes. And I'm gonna make garlic mashed, or I'm sorry, the Parmesan mashed potatoes. And when they're done, I can just cover them up with foil and leave them on the stove. Okay, because we're coming to the point where we're just about ready. Okay, drain them. I'm going to do these home style, which is I'm not gonna make them really fine and like whipped potatoes. So I'm still gonna have chunks of potato in here. So I'm just gonna use one of my whips and basically rough mash my potatoes. A potato masher, mashed potatoes is what, this is so nice and tender. Steaming up my glasses. Okay. Little pepper, 
Okay, salt. Same way, when I season, I'm up top, far away, not right on top of it. I'm going to, I cut the salt down a little bit because I'm going to add my Parmesan cheese, which is right here. This will be my salt and some of my, a lot of my flavor. And then I'll add a little touch of heavy cream just to smoothen, smooth it out just a little bit. It smells phenomenal. Now if I, if I slap that really hard, it ends up hitting me right in the face. So I'm going to do it slower. Okay. That's how quick mashed potatoes, mashed potatoes are done. What I'm going to do, take my spatula, clean up around the side. Okay. I'm going to cover the pot. Okay, I'm going to put this over on the thing, but I'm going to cover it with my saute pan. It's a lid or a lid. I just like to cover it up quickly when we're doing this fast. That's how I want to get it done. My water is boiling for my asparagus. My asparagus can go in. Asparagus is in the water. Now, I need my sauce. It's one of the last things that I have to do is my giblet gravy. So I'm going to check the turkey one more time, then make the giblet gravy and get ready to put it out. One thing left to do, my giblet gravy. Really simple. I'm going to use the same frying pan that I just covered my potatoes with. That's what I'm going to make the gravy in. Right off. Same pan right on the stove. This is the same pan I did the sausage in. I didn't even wash it yet. Don't need to. Cover up my potatoes with something else. I have the flavor in there. Okay. So now I'm going to take the things I need to make the gravy right in the pan. I'll take some shallots, stuff I have sitting right around. I want the pan hot. Okay, I have my giblets. I'm gonna pull them out in the middle. What I wanna start with is the same thing when I go to start any sauce. I'm going to strain it off so I don't necessarily have to take a lot of things out that I normally would have. More tarragon, more thyme, a couple of leeks. In the bottom, they're making, they're making nice, wonderful sounds in the bottom of the pan. I'm getting ready to make that gravy. Okay, I have my stock. Pull my stock right next. Take the same trick that I use with this. Put, put my, my strainer inside my stock so I can just take the stock off that I need. I'm going to add to that a little bit of seasoning salt. In the meantime, I'm gonna take my strainer, my cup, I'm going to take out, with my help of my tongs, my giblets. Okay, I'm going to let those sit over here because I'm going to chop them up and put them in the rest of my sauce. A little bit of butter. Saute my veggies and my herbs. Tarragon. I'm going to add a little bit more sage. Okay, sage is one of my, sage and tarragon are my two favorite herbs for this, for turkey. It's in there in Bell's seasoning, okay? It's cracking, it's cracking and it's popping. That's the way we like it. I'm gonna add to the fat. I added butter in there. I'm gonna add a little bit more butter. I'm making a roux. This is my thickening agent. And what I'm gonna do is add hot stock to a hot roux. Just enough flour in here to pick up the starch that's in the pan. This is going to thicken my gravy. When you take the roast out of the oven, sprinkle the, you sprinkle the, the, the pan with flour and that makes your roux. That's the same way we make old fashioned pan gravy. So in this case, I'm making a roux with everything I have left in the pan. I'm going to add to this the beautiful stock that I've already been making. Cup at a time. It'll start thickening almost instantly. This is my gravy. My giblet, beautiful giblet gravy. Giblet's already cooked. I'm adding my stock. It's got a beautiful, nice, light brown color, like a turkey gravy should. I'm gonna let this cook beautifully. There we 
All right. I'm going to turn this down, let it simmer. Okay, as that simmers, I'm taking my stock off. My asparagus is done. Adjusting my, my temperatures to make it right. This is done. I'm going to pour this out. Beautiful asparagus. Right away onto my serving platter. I'm going to check my turkey now because guess what? It's time to take the turkey out. Take away the old turkey, the turkey I didn't use yet. Take the turkey out. Ow! Drippings right into the gravy. Turkey's done. Okay, stuffing and potatoes are almost done. The mashed potatoes are done. This is done. The gravy's done. Waiting for the gravy. I'm done. I have to let the roast sit for at least 15 minutes before I slice it. While I'm waiting to slice it, I'm going to start plating up the rest of my dinner. Thanksgiving dinner in less than an hour. We're just about there. Okay, watching the gravy again. Stirring. While this is happening, I'm going to strain this off, put this into another pot, and then add the giblets. So it's time to cut up the giblets. Now, fine, fine dice on these. Very hot. This is my garnish that goes inside my sauce. Actually, this would be gravy, I should say sauce, because the I said before, the delineation is, this is definitely gonna have the drippings from roasted meat. So this is for my giblet gravy. Okay, right into this, still with some of the stock in it. Let's finish the gravy. My pot, my strainer, this is my stock in the gravy that we just finished on the stove. I want to take all this other stuff out of there. It doesn't belong. Okay. Beautiful. Put that away. Add my giblets. Start in. Giblet gravy is already ready to go. I'll have to put that aside. Okay. Move my utensils. Because it's time to plate up. Okay, now, my stuffing's done, my mashed potatoes are done, my sweet potatoes are done, the asparagus is done, the, the cranberry sauce is done. I'm just gonna slice this. The last thing I do will be slice the turkey. So let me get everything else on the plate, and then we'll slice the turkey and see how we did it in an hour. Okay, cranberry sauce. Slightly liquid, just like a relish. See the orange, see the cranberries. Beautiful, wonderful flavor. Beautiful. Cranberry sauce. In the oven. Oh, the beautiful stuffing. Already done. Sweet potatoes. Already done. mashed potatoes. Oh, beautiful. Smell the Parmesan, it's just delicious. I'm gonna burn myself all day today. Okay, gravy, asparagus, sweet potatoes, dressing, cranberry sauce, the turkey's the only thing left. Time to slice. Let me get my slicer, 
This has rested at least 20 minutes, 15 minutes after I took it out because I took it out while I was finishing everything else. The turkey doesn't take an hour, it takes 40 minutes, 45, if you really push it. The flatter and lower it is, the better it is to cook. Knife, platter, dark meat, light meat. Ow! Still hot, okay? Right from the oven. I'm gonna flip this over and slice it like this. Perfectly cut. You can see the moisture coming out of it. It is lovely, okay? Still moist, still wonderful. It's hot. Because I'm in a rush, the things like holding things still, I'm just running away with all my bad habits of cooking just to get this done in the timely fashion. Okay, beautiful long slices. You can see the moisture. You can see how lovely it's, it's acting as I slice it. This is the thigh, boneless thigh. I'm gonna take this beautiful skin. I'm actually gonna cut this in some strips because I'm a skin guy. I love this, the flavor of the skin. That's where I put all the flavoring on the outside, including the mustard. Same thing with this part of the thigh. Beautiful slices, still moist, okay? Beautiful, okay. Breast, we, we slice this from this side. Take this. Cut from the bottom so I don't have to cut through the skin. Beautiful slices. Okay. Can we tell that this was cooked off the bone? The piece, the person who's going to try and pick that up, I really don't want to eat with because this is the way it comes out beautifully every time. As moist as can be, fully cooked inside of an hour. So hot, I just did pull it out of the oven. I'm able to get through the skin, so I have a beautiful piece of crunchy skin on the outside. The skin did protect the flesh as we were cooking it. My last piece, turkey. Thanksgiving dinner in an hour. How is that possible? It's all about the turkey. You can go get your turkey, take it to the butcher, and ask him to do exactly what I did in the first eight minutes of the video and have them butcher it down. And then all I did was roast it just as you saw on a screen in the oven, high temperature for 25 to 30 minutes, low temperature, medium temperature after that for another 20. Let it rest before you slice it. If you slice it right out of the oven, all the juice and moisture will run right out. If it gets the chance to firm up and set and actually come down from 300 to 75, in this kitchen, 75 degrees, it'll loosen up and tighten up and retain all that moisture. It's beautiful, it's moist, it's fully cooked, ready to eat. Thanksgiving dinner is ready in an hour. I'm Chef Paul from the Culinary Arts and Hospitality Program at Community College of Philadelphia.